There we go. All right, so we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And uh, this is the last chapter uh, of this book. And once again, this was a, a great book to go through because this book really gives real life, actual Christian experience that definitely relates to us today. It talked about uh, uh, the issues and the problems that were going on in this Corinthian church, the immaturity that was going on, the struggles. Um, and even as we conclude today, uh, Paul once again is going to get into some issues that are important for us to, to keep focus on. I think one of the wonderful things is when we get into the second book, we're going to see again. Um, we, we talk about, we hear about, you know, those that are going through difficulties and everything. And 2 Corinthians is really going to be a book about how to handle difficult problems, circumstances, and difficult circumstances. And uh, so we'll get a chance to actually deal with that. And it kind of gives a nice little uh, bridge towards that, even as we get into this last chapter. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and, and take a listen to the chapter, uh, chapter 16 of First Corinthians. Saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, let's even start so that from do the beginning. Ye. Upon the first. All right, let's try again. Chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you, when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now if Timothy is come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me. For I look for him with a brethren. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus, and Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. So we see Paul's closing letter to the Corinthians, his first letter. <clears throat> Now, as I stated in here, that you're going to see some things that were stated that we're going to hear about in the very first uh, 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 chapters of 2 Corinthians. And it all has to do with things that sometimes we are looking to do. Anybody here makes pl make plans? We all make plans, right? We plan to do certain things. And uh, the interesting thing about it, and we're going to deal about that in, in just a minute, that a lot of times when you make plans, one of the things that once you become a Christian, what's one of the things that you, you, you try to tack on to, well, I'm going to go do this and I want to go do that, if what? If the Lord permits. If the Lord permits or if the Lord will. And that's an, that's an important thing to keep in mind once you come, become educated and, and you truly believe that God is your, your, uh, your God and he's your savior and he directs all things. When you really see him as the God of all creation, you begin to put that uh, that salutation, that that little 
footnote at the end of all your statements because you know that God is supreme over what? Over all. Plus, uh, most of the time when you make that statement, it's because you really are not looking to do what you want to do. You're trying to do what God has what? Planned for you to do, has gifted for you to do. And that's a, uh, a sense of just uh, beginning to totally commit and surrender to the will of the Lord. All right, so with that being said, let's take a listen. Let's take a look and see what we see here, and then we're going to kind of give some, uh, uh, some, some four, four tenths to what we'll see in 2 Corinthians as well. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I uh, have given order to the churches of, of Galatia, uh, even to even uh, do ye. So what he's saying is, now this, they're going to take up some money. They're going to take up an offering. All right, and he's about ready to explain to them how he wants this done, and he tells them that we're going to be taking up a, a collection, and we also did this when we were at the Galatian uh, church, or when I, I spoke with the Galatian church, I asked him to do the same thing. All right, and so then he gives this illustration here from from uh, the second verse. He says, "Upon the first day of the week, what's the first day of the week? Sunday. Sunday. All right, so." He's letting them know. And some people always question, did the early church gather on Sunday? And uh, here's one example that shows, yes, they did. All right? He says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay aside by him in store as uh, God has prospered him all his tithes and all his offerings. Is that what your Bible said? No. It don't say that? What does it say? Let's lay aside and store as God has prospered him. Oh, simple as that. So it's something that you do according to your what? Your ability to give. Right? And I think it's important that Paul makes that out and he points that out. He says that, that lay aside uh, as God hath prospered him. That there'll be no gatherings when I come. So he's basically saying, when I get there, I don't want to take an offer. And Paul is saying, because I don't want to make a big show. You ever been to a, a, a service where the offering takes an hour? Mm -hmm. It takes an hour to gather the money. Because it's a big thing. Because they're trying to motivate. They're trying. And what Paul is saying, I want everyone that wants to give to lay aside some money even before I come. So basically... Set in mind, or plan, or or or, or uh, put a, uh, a a desire of what you want to do, and do it before I get there. A lot of times, when you have something that you want to do, and this is one of the things that we're trying to encourage you, when you see things that need to be done, and you feel you want to help, go do it. But tr try not to ever allow yourself to get pressured into something, because that's not from your heart. You got to sit, when somebody say, I need you to give this amount of money, or I need you to give this, you got to be very careful with that because that's not according to how things are supposed to be done by uh, uh, the writings of the church. Now, a lot of people want to go back to the Old Testament and talk about the law. And even when they talk about, well, when, when Jesus was um, talking about the Pharisees and he told the Pharisees, he, says, he said, when you give, don't give like the Pharisees do. He said, because they like to do what? To, to stand, in stand in the middle of the marketplace and, 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 and make a big uh, to-do about it so everyone can see. He says, but when you give, let not your, your right hand know what your left hand does. And uh, he says that uh, he also makes a statement that you know, they give their tithes and offerings. And he says, and, and he said, you're putting greater, greater emphasis on the small things because they tithe mint and cumin. So they would grow little vegetable gardens and, and uh, um, spice gardens. Mm. And they would count on all the stuff that they get out of the garden and tithe even that mm. to, to that degree of detail. You know, I'm tithing, I'm giving a tenth of all my little, my, my spices. And Jesus said, you're putting emphasis on the minor things and forgetting the larger things. But he said the minor things were, were important to do. But he was talking to them as people that were still under the what? Law. Under the law. Once Jesus died and the law was fulfilled, we're no longer under the law. And people, a lot of times, 
won't like to uh, admit that a lot, of, and a lot has to do with how historically the church has been um, Doing organized. And it's been organized, and a lot of times money has always been a way of uh, how can I make you feel good about your giving or guilty about your giving. And both go hand in hand, and it's really unfortunate. But uh, with that being said, it's important that Paul puts this out. Give as God has prospered him. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And uh, I could say a whole lot more about that, but I'm going to move along. Verse 3. And when I come... Whomsoever ye uh, shall ap uh, approve by your letter, tell uh, uh, by your letter, them will I send to bring your liber liberality to Jerusalem. So he's saying now, when I come, we're going to have somebody to take the money that was risen, that we raised, and bring it to the to the what the Jerusalem church. How, how come Paul didn't? Because Paul had an issue every time he went to Jerusalem. Remember when we were in, in Acts? Right. And every time he wanted to, he, he wanted to go to, to, right. to Jerusalem. But every time he'd go there and start talking, there would be a what? There'd be a little riot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Paul had an issue. And so he knew that there was something going on because they didn't like him. Because Paul came from that, that, that uh, Sanhedrin and that, that whole pharisaical community. And they didn't like him. And then they didn't like Paul's message. And plus, Paul was very um, focused on what he knew the gospel was. You don't have to do the Jewish law anymore. And that offended a lot of the Jews. And we'll see as we move along through this, especially when we get through some of the other uh, books, where well, Paul has to, to, to fight. Actually, even in the, in the next book, we'll see that. Well, Paul has to actually uh, rebuke Peter for Peter's uh, uh, inability to stay focus on the liberality that Jesus gave us because they would go to these dinners and Paul points out that, that, that Peter would eat with the with the uh, uh, the non-Jewish people. He would eat with all the, the Gentile folk. But then when the hierarchy from the Jerusalem sect would come, these Judaizers, they, they believed in Jesus, but they believed that you still had to do some of the, the Mosaic law uh, uh, as a part of being saved, Peter was uncomfortable, and Peter left the Gentiles and went to go sit with the Judaizers. And Paul had to had to rebuke him. He says, "You're wrong in doing that." And he says, "And you also did did wrong by convincing Barnabas to do that." And he had to correct Peter. And so the point being is that uh, we have to look at the fact that Jesus paid it all. When he said on the cross, "It is, it is finished," that's exactly what it meant. And now all you got to do is just believe it. It's as simple as that. All right? And there's a lot more we could say on that, but um, it's important that we understand. So he had to bring this to the Jerusalem church. And I think it's interesting also that, you know, the Spirit of God works in a lot of different ways. It's interesting that the church that is in Jerusalem, that is the, 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 the Jewish sect um, that was predominant in securing the word of God, the Old Testament, that, that was fulfilled by Jesus. That that was the church that ended up being in poverty. They ended up being, you know, struggling. And then what happened... <laughs> I don't know what that laugh now. But then what happened... Huh? Uh, but then what happened is that they, that was the church that ended up in poverty. And then the Gentile church had to come and give to this church that gave to the Gentile church the word of God. Remember, the word of God back in, the, in those days was only the what? The Old Testament. Testament. And so the Jewish people, they preserved the word and gave it to them and, and uh, allowed them to see through the word how Jesus fulfilled the whole uh, uh, writings of the law and, uh, and of the prophets. But in circumstances which we could go back and we look at Acts and we saw how they sold all their goods. Remember that? Mm -hmm. how they sold, And they ended up uh, down the line and some and some financial strain, but now this this uh, uh, region or this group of folk that had given to the world the word of God now needs the Gentiles to give to them of the natural. We'll we'll see this uh, even as we move along uh, uh, in uh, Second Corinthians, how uh, the Jewish people gave of their spiritual to the nat to to the Gentiles 
And the Gentiles are now giving up their natural, their basic funds and, and uh, money to these uh, individuals. And we'll talk more about that on, uh, when we get into 2 Corinthians. All right, so they bring the liberality to Jerusalem. Verse 4. And if it be meet that I go also, then uh, uh, they shall uh, go with me. Now, Paul is saying, if it be meet, or in other words, if it be, if it be a good idea, if, if, if possible, I'm going to go also. So he's beginning to make plans. You know, I, might go, I might go also. Look at verse 5. Now, when I come unto you, who is he talking to when I come unto you? The Corinthian church, right? So he said, now, when I come unto you, when I shall pass through Macedonia, he's telling them some plans that he's, he's trying to make. Now, keep in mind, when you start making plans and then you start running your plans through God, is it, is it, is it possible that sometimes these plans can be altered mm -hmm. when God puts his final say on it? Mm -hmm. So you keep that in mind, what we read just now, and then uh, the Lord said the same when next week when we get together and we start reading the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, we find out what happened to those plans. Okay, but look at him talking here. He goes, now he goes, I would like, you know, I want to come up there to see you. And when I pass through Macedonia, I'm hoping, you know, I can stop by and see you. Verse 6. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you. He goes, not just stay for a little while, but stay for the whole what? For the whole winter. That ye may uh, bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. So, I mean, that's a nice desire. And there's nothing wrong with having a plan. That you want to go do something and be with somebody for a certain point in time. But you've always got to keep in mind that, um, you know, God always has his ultimate reasons for why he wants things done a certain way. And we should always be willing to submit to that. Verse 7. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord, what? Permits. So Paul is putting that in there. He's like, if the Lord permits. And we won't find out now, but we'll see a little later on what happens. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. He's saying, I'm going to stay uh, here at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. So he's saying, I have great opportunities. I'm, I'm receiving great uh, uh, abilities to do the work, Lord's work while I'm here. And there are many adversaries. So he's also finding what? He's finding people that will also what? Come against him. They will find the people that will, will battle with him. And what Paul is looking at is he's finding that there is good opportunity to win battles with those that are against what he is doing. And a lot of his adversaries are these Judaizers. They want to say you still have to do Mosaic law stuff in order to be saved. All right, and Paul is saying no. The only thing you need to know is Jesus is your Savior, and He died for you. You have to believe the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and uh, that is what salvation is all about. And Paul has many people that will not agree with him, even though uh, that's what the gospel is all about. Verse ten. Now, if Timotheus uh, come, see that he may be with you without fear. Now he's talking to them, saying, if Timothy comes up to you, comfort him and strengthen him. Don't let him be there with fear. One reason is because Timothy was a young guy. He was a young lad. But Paul saw in him a lot of potential. This is one of the wonderful, wonderful things about Paul's relationship. Paul knew, I'm not going to be here forever. And so I got to tell these young folks some of the gifts and the abilities that they have so they can move on and step into the mature, responsible role that they are capable of doing. And Paul is now doing that for Timothy. And so he lets them know, if Timothy does come up to you, you know, don't let him be a uh, fear. You know, comfort him. You know, let him know that, that, that he is approved uh, and, and, and welcome with you. So then in, Paul's encouraging them to, uh, to take that attitude towards Timothy. For he worketh the work of the Lord 
as I also do. So he's seeing in, in Timothy one of the same things that he saw in himself. And I think that's one of the things that we should always keep in mind. A lot of times, God will bring you through things. And as you move, move on in your life and you go through some certain things and you have built up a, a, a sense of knowledge and experience of things that you did, things that you didn't do but wish you could have done, uh, experiences, and you just built that knowledge base. Well, then as you mature and you begin to mentor the next generation, you'll be surprised how often people will come into your, 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 your world that need the same information, the same structure, the same knowledge base that you have. You don't go through your difficulties for nothing. You don't go through your experiences for nothing. They are given to you by God. Because remember, God said, uh, um, all things work together for, for good to them that love the Lord, that are called according to, to the purpose. It didn't say all the good things. It didn't say all the bad things. It said what? All things. So now you are being, you're going through this because you're going to be used by God and you're going to have to pull from those experiences that you have. There's a reason why you're going through what you're going through. It's not just, and it's not just for, you, you got to look past what God is trying to do in you and try to look at what God is trying to use you to do in somebody else. There's reasons for it. And remember, there, there is this passing of blessings. If all the blessings stop with you, then you know, you're, you're going to be very, very uh, uh, constipated Christian. Right? If you eat all the food you want to eat and you never release any, you're not going to be very comfortable. It's the same thing when it comes down to receiving of the Lord. Things have to go through you. We talked about that last uh, time we met, about the difference between the sea, the, uh, the sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee allows water to pass what? Through. The Dead Sea receives water and passes it to nothing. So therefore, all the toxins stay right in the Dead Sea. No animal, no fish can live in that sea because it has no outlet. It has, it has no way of giving anything. And when you become a person that you give to nobody and you're trying to receive from everybody, you will become toxic. And nothing can survive in that. No relationships, no friendships. It just, it just won't work. So in order to be, you have to be able to and willing to help others. And once you become willing to help others, stuff will flow through you. And the things that flow through people that help other people are the things of God. And God is constantly moving in your life because you're helping other people. And it's important that we do that. So Paul's relationship with Timothy was very important. God used Paul, and now Paul is using what he has gained from the Lord to help Timothy. And uh, once again, when we get into 2 Corinthians, you'll see Paul's really going to open up. And he's going to talk about some of the stuff he went through and some of the experiences that he had. All right? And we'll see a little bit more about this great man called Paul. Verse 11. Let no man therefore uh, despise him, uh, but conduct uh, him forth in peace, that he may uh, come unto me, for I look for uh, him with the brother. All right, so he's basically saying we, we're, we're looking for this to be a mutually blessed relationship. All right, so when Timothy comes, we don't want any kind of uh, uh, confrontation. We don't want any type of conflict. We're looking for it to be a blessed situation, and, um, and we're looking for God's peace to be there. And we're looking for it to be uh, a, a comfortable situation so that even when I come, I can continue in that same vein. Paul doesn't want to have to come and do what? Add more correction. All right? You don't want to have to go to something that should be a wonderful thing and end up going in to correct. All right? Can you imagine having to go to your kid's graduation and you got to put the kid on punishment because he's acting? You know, that, that's not what you... You didn't go for that. That wasn't the purpose. You went there to celebrate the achievement and you end up having to do what? Correct. So you're hoping that, that, that they would adhere to you and follow along. And that's what Paul is doing here. All right, so he changes it, uh, he, he changes up a little bit and now he's telling them, now as 
as touching our brother Apollos. Now remember, remember Apollos from uh, our earlier study, especially in Acts? He was one of those very eloquent speakers. All right? And remember, Apollos was, speak, was preaching uh, only knowing the, uh, initially only knowing the teachings of John the Baptist. Uh, and um, then uh, Apollo and Aquila said, have you uh, uh, received the spirit since you believe? And uh, 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 Apollo says, I didn't even know there was such a thing. And uh, Aquila and Priscilla had to do what? Educate him uh, even the more. But his ability to speak was what his, uh, uh, was, was his fame. He knew how to take words. There wasn't a whole lot of stammering and stuttering and stuff. He knew he was fluent, uh, according to uh, a lot of historical uh, writings about him. But look at what Paul says. And it's touching our brother Apollo. I greatly desired him to come unto you. Paul wanted Apollos to go to the Corinthian church because he knew that Apollos was a great, learned man. He followed the Lord and he wanted Apollos to go to Corinth and, and help to educate and teach and to develop that church. Uh, with the brethren, but he will was not his will was not at all to come at this time. All right? Now, Apollos' will was not he didn't want to come. All right, so now you got two great leaders in the church. One saying, "Apollos, you should go," and the other one saying, "No, I, I shouldn't go." All right, and you want to say, "Well, who was right?" I don't know, <laughs> but I do know this. That you can't put your will on nobody else. Mm. I can't say, well, I think you need to be doing this and you need to be doing that. Yeah. You got to tell the person, the Lord has to speak to you. The Lord has to encourage you. But I wonder if, uh, have you ever, has anyone ever told you this about you? Has anyone ever said this about you? Because it can't come from a person. It has to come from who? Mm -hmm. From the Lord. Somebody can, can see God's hand on you. But if you don't see it, if you don't recognize it, it, it really will never develop to the, to the ability that it should. It could be go to the point where God is really looking to do something, but you may be able to do certain things, just whatever, whatever, but God's looking to really use your gift. But you have to become the one that what? Recognizes it and sees it. So it said that... Uh, uh, Paul thought that Apollos w w should go, and Apollos said that it wasn't his will to go at all. He didn't feel like going, or he believed that, that was not God's will in his life to go. But he will come to you uh, when he shall have a convenient time. So Paul is saying, well, when the Lord speaks to Apollos, then he'll come unto you. Even though I thought you, he should have came unto you at that, at, you know, now. But Apollos obviously has gotten another word from the Lord, and he's following that. And I have to trust Apollos' ju what? judgment. Okay. So then he goes on in verse 13. Uh, he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quick like men, be strong. So he's telling you there are certain things that you need to make sure that you're doing. Watch. Now, that's something that we have to do on, uh, even today. We're still watching because there are all kinds of things that are coming upon the scene. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me, and I, and I won't elaborate on it, but Jesus made an interesting statement. He said uh, uh, his second coming will be as it was in the days of what? Noah. Noah. All right? And I think it's interesting to see that there's a lot of things that are happening under the scenes not very visible in our, in, in our, uh, our news coverage, that mirror some of the things of the days of Noah. Because of the days of Noah, what were, what were one of the things that were, was uh, significant? There was a... Uh, giving and marriage. Giving and marriage, okay. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says in, in Noah, I mean in Noah, in Genesis 6, that the sons of God, God. saw the what? Daughters of men... Mm -hmm and uh, that they were beautiful and came unto them and had children by them, all right? And these were men of renown. And they were, what, giants or Nephilim or Anunnaki uh, uh, type of individuals. And what uh, uh, was interesting when God chose Noah was that God said that Noah was perfect 
in all his generation. See, people, people, they stop right there where it says, Noah was perfect. And they say, well, no, no, that's not what it says. It says, Noah was perfect in all his, what, generation. That means his generation was not infected by the manipulation that was going on during that day by this spiritual entities. They were manipulating the gene pool. Doesn't that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. You see? And so... I just want to we're going to deal with that a lot more, but I think it's important that we keep them on. When we talk about watch, we watch those things, right? keep an eye on those things. And there's so many different scriptures that I could pull out, but I, I would be going off course here. So let me just throw that out there. Stand fast. What are we standing fast in? Stand fast in the Word. All right? We stand fast in the Word. All right? and, and it's important that we do that. All right? We have to stand fast. We have to be... Uh, 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 quick or, or strong and, and confident in the word and it's important that we do that um, and don't allow anyone to move you right? because a lot of people we got a lot of so called scholars that are telling us that the word of God is not God's word and it, it is you know these, these people that were not there and they taken votes right? the religious the, the, uh, the Jesus project I think that's what's the name of it. Um, they went out and they took votes on what words in the Gospels were actually said by Jesus. Now, the way that they, how did they actually come to the conclusion as to which words were actually Jesus' words and words that may have been added? Did they pray about it? Did they seek God's counsel on it? No, they took a vote. And then if they voted, this is what the, then they said, okay, these were definitely God's words. Well, how do you know? Well, we voted. I mean, so your vote is what's going to determine what is truly the words of God. And so we have to keep in mind, this is scholarly, so-called, you know, knowledgeable individuals. And you see them all over the uh, uh, public television. And I like watching them because I like seeing what they, what they got to say. But my goodness, some of the things that they say, is, it's pretty sad. They do a lot of documentaries. They're doing a lot of talking. But their bottom line is that they're trying to discourage your confidence in the Word of God. Always keep that in mind. People that love to attack the Word of God. All right? And verse 14. Let all your things be done with charity. What's another word for charity? Love. love. Right? A charity is a giving love, a sacrificial love. Let some of your things be done in charity. No, let all your things. So everything that we do should be done with a sacrificial. And that whole aspect of sacrificial, of sacrifice, of denying, that's a key spiritual aspect that we have to embrace because that is a nature of our God. We take on his nature. Fulfilling my every desire is what the devil wanted. Everything I want I want. I want to fulfill every appetite. I want to fulfill every desire. Everything that is that, that I every whim and whim that I want. I'm gonna matter of fact. I want to be above God. I want everything that I want, the way I want it, when I want it. That's not God. That's the spirit of the enemy. True love is sacrificial. I will help people even if it means that I don't get everything that my my uh, my desires, all my desires fulfilled, and that's that's a, that's a sacrificial and a good love. And the one one thing that you can begin to recognize that you're taking on the nature of your father, of the God that you serve, is when you have the ability to sacrifice. I know this is the right thing to do, but it means that I won't have the ability to do this. But that's fine, and you're okay with it. That's the mature, you know, we get away from that ability to be immature as what Paul was talking to this Corinthian church about in the very beginning. You're serving the Lord, but you are very immature. You don't deny yourself anything. You don't sacrifice anything. There's no ability to, to stand up and to deny the flesh. But everything that the flesh desires, everything that the appetite wants, you give it to it. A sacrificial or charitable love always has somebody else's concern, always has the Lord's focus 
always has a self-denial within it. And that's something we should keep in mind as we, as we be, continue to mature. And once again, this is the letter to the church about how to get from just, just knowing the Lord as your Savior. And I hate to use the word just because that's a great thing. I shouldn't use it. But knowing the Lord as your Savior and moving on into a mature walk with the Lord. All right? 15. I beseech you, brethren, uh, ye know the house of Stephan. Uh, Stephanus, that it is uh, the fruitful of Anaconda, and that they have uh, the addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. All right? Addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That means they're addicted to helping what? Other people. All right? And trust me, you can get addicted to a lot of things. It's, and some things uh, is it's, it's, it's important to keep in mind, a lot of times they say too much of anything is, is, is bad. But it's important to have a hunger and a thirst for the ministry, for whatever God has called you. To. They have addicted themselves to the ministry. All right, now when we get into, once again, 2 Corinthians, it's going to talk about, you know, one of the, verse, one of the chapters will open up and says, Therefore, seeing we have received this, what, ministry, we faint not. In other words, we don't quit. All right. And so when you are addicting yourself to the ministry, it's important that you recognize that you have a ministry. That's a key because you, you're not going to addict yourself to, to, the, to something you don't think you have. But once you recognize, I do have something, and now I got to begin to figure out how, I got to figure out how to use this to bless the saints. I do have a ministry. I do have a gift. How, now, how do I use this? You, you get addicted to thinking and, and figuring and, and praying and asking God to give you the wisdom. How do I use this to help the saints? All right, it's important to keep in mind. All right, verse 16. That ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. All right? Submit yourselves. Right? That's a more mature Christian walk, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Submit yourself. All right? All right? So that's, once again, another mature Christian attitude. I got to submit myself to the things that God is trying to do and not get what I, not fulfill my own personal what? Appetites. All right? So he's closing this letter with some mature verbiage. Opening this letter, he was telling them how what? immature they were. All right? Verse 17. I am glad of the, the coming of Stephanos and Fortunatos and uh, Anacondas or whatever. <laughs> All right. You see, I don't speak these languages. Right? For that which was lacking in your part, they have what? Supply. So, Stephanatus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. Am I saying that Achaeus. right? Achaicus. thank you. Uh, they are a blessing because these are people that Paul is pointing out. These are some charitable brothers. They give of themselves. They're not focusing on what is best for them, but they're focusing on what is best for uh, the people to whom they are ministering to. All right? Verse 18, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. See, therein is a wonderful thing. When you have a ministry, your ministry is refreshing to people. People receive it and feel renewed. They will feel blessed. But you have to be able to recognize that you have a what? You have a gift. You have a ministry. And you allow God to use it. And, and your gift, you... you more than likely, you do have more than one. And there are certain stages in your life where one will be more predominant than the other. And some of your gifts are connected. You can't do this gift till you get done with that gift. All right? So it's important to recognize that uh, you do need to see these things as gifts and things that will be a blessing to not just yourself. 
And the reason why you get blessed is because you are seeing God's will being fulfilled in your life by your ability to help others. And it's maybe not always so, so clear cut either. Maybe it's not always so easy to, to figure out. But it is something to, uh, to challenge yourself to do. Verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is uh, in their house. And here we see, once again, Aquila and Priscilla. All right? And these were some very great leaders. And they had a church, a, a wonderful cathedral a building. Is that what it said? No. Oh. In house. oh, it was in their house. Okay, so how did the early church meet? In the house. In houses. Okay. So uh, it's funny to see that nowadays we see this great movement of house churches that have just taken over. Uh, it's, to me, it's funny how towards the, 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 the beginning and what I think is, and I, you know, this is just me speaking, I have no special revelation, but I think we're living in the last days. Towards the end, it's reverting back to smaller fellowships, house churches, and things of that nature that are extremely popular. If you don't believe me, go on the internet and just, just pop that in there and see how many different documentaries you see about the movement of the house churches. Uh, you'd be surprised how popular and how um, vast it is. And not just in America. The, the biggest is, is, is outside. You got in China. Because see, in China, it's illegal. If you don't have the church, the, the state church, you can't gather and teach. So they, they have to have house churches. Because they have to keep it, what, small. All right? And it's important. And, and China's not the only place. There's a lot of places. But America is happening, still happening here. It's happening here because people, are, they're, they're getting fed up with a lot of things that uh, the bureaucracy and the hypocrisy and all the other different type of things that are going on uh, in some of these uh, um, other situations. All right? But uh, with that being said, you know, God is God over all. All right, verse 20. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. All right? And I think it's important that uh, we do recognize each other as as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Right? When you see somebody that's, that, that loves the Lord, that automatically makes you kin. You automatically become one because you're of one what? Body. Remember we talked about that earlier. How Paul said, how can you be upset with this person because he's doing this thing? Can the eye be upset you know, with the hand? Right? And we remember we went through that whole uh, personification of how uh, if we were all one body, we need all things. And some of the things that we need the most are not visible. Right? But you can live without eyeballs. But you, you can't live without intestines. You're not going to live without a liver. You're not going to live without lungs. And those are not the visible parts of the body. So not all the, the, the important things are things that you see all out in the limelight. Some of the things that are very uh, uh, unknown or unrecognizable are the most critical portions of the body. All right, and um, it's important to keep that in mind. Verse 21, the salutation of me, Paul, with my own uh, hand. Now, what he's saying by that is he's, just, he's getting ready to write something with his own writing. Now, it's traditionally believed that Paul had bad, what, eyesight. Um, one of the times that he talks about the church having such a great love for him, he said, I think that you would have even plucked your eyes out and given them to me. And another time he says, see, I'm writing with my own hand. See how large the letters I write with. And the other thing that while he is doing this is because it became popular as these letters went around, the, the people were sending letters and saying they were from Paul, but they weren't. So Paul began to, at the end, because he, with, uh, with his uh, bad eyesight, and he couldn't really write, and he needed uh, to have an immensary or you know, to a secretary or person to take uh, or a scribe to take the notes for him and to write as he would speak. Uh, but he wanted that because what that meant then was anybody's handwriting could have been a message from Paul because Paul was sending these, would send letters that were written by other people. So anybody can say, oh, this was written, this was from Paul, but it was written by 
you know, I mean, what Paul dictated. So then what Paul began to do was at the end of his letters, he began to write his, now it's kind of like his own little seal mm -hmm. that this is definitely a letter yeah, from me. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and we'll see when we get into 2 Corinthians, there were a lot of letters that got to Corinth that, that uh, people said this was from Paul, but it wasn't from Paul. All right. So he says, I'll salute you with my own hand. And so in verse 22, he says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be a curse or anathema, maranatha. So he's saying here that if you don't love the Lord, you're, you're, you're cursed with a curse. And that, 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 that sounds harsh, but it is the absolute truth. You know, sometimes just telling somebody that the point blank truth is the most loving thing you can do. You know, you just tell, you, when you see somebody, sometimes some people going down the wrong road, if you, sometimes you got to just almost smack them in the face with words, be like, listen. But it's the most loving thing you can do. You know, because you know that if you don't catch their attention, they're going down. All right, and so uh, Paul is saying that if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a curse. And you're cursed not for just time, but you're cursed for all eternity. All right. And then in verse 23, he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. All right? So he wants the grace. What is grace? Mercy. Grace is the ability to, re to receive things that you could never earn. You could never pay back God for what he's given to you. You could never earn or feel worthy for what God has given you. That's God's grace. You know, I often think about that. You know, I, I, I look and I sometimes I see some of the things that I have that I know from a historical standpoint. That's why sometimes it's good to know what was here before you got here. So when I'm in the shower and I'm thinking of the shower, I, I tell people this all the time. When I'm turning on the hot water, I'm thanking God for that because I, 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 after studying history and I realized how many people never ever had an opportunity to take a hot shower and how many people in the world today there's more people in the world today that has never taken a hot shower mm -hmm. so I, don't, I, I can't take that for granted going to work having a job being able to get up and walk around do you know how many people that just cannot stand up so when you start thinking about that you start thinking about all the things that we take for granted all the systems that work you know, God has blessed this, this, uh, us here in America where we have telephone systems and we have sewer systems and we have um, electrical systems. All those systems came and are here because God put them on this planet. There's nothing that came that we see didn't come from this planet. Everything came out the ground. Even man. Man was formed from the what? Dust of this planet. All right. And so everything came from here, and God knew it was here. It was just like, you know, you know when you buy when you buy a, a a puzzle for your kid, and they put the puzzle, you know what the puzzle's supposed to look like, but they gotta scour around and look around and find all the right pieces and start connecting. This won't connect to that piece. You try to keep connecting that piece to that piece, you'll never get the puzzle to put together. Find the pieces that connect, and then you'll begin to see there's things that you can do. I put some wonderful pictures in this in this box but if you don't start connecting the pieces you'll never see the picture mm -hmm. and God is saying I put some wonderful things on this planet it's a planet of great puzzles and he's allowed us to put these pieces together and we got jet planes and cars going on I thank God for all that stuff Amen. that's God's grace because we don't deserve it and it's oftentimes we forget that we just think well everybody got no everybody don't everybody's got a car no everybody don't have a car well, everybody's got a job. No, everybody don't have a job. God's grace. All right? So then you begin to recognize opportunities and things that you have. It's like, wow, I think I better take advantage of this. I think I better thank God for this. This don't happen to everybody. Everybody don't have this. And as you get older, you begin to appreciate it a little bit more. You know, and it's important to keep that in mind. All right. Um, so verse 20, 23, it said, And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And 24, My love be with you all in Jesus Christ. 
Amen. All right. So he's saying, now my love be with you all. He goes, I absolutely care for you. I absolutely love you. I absolutely want the best for you. And he is praying and, and writing this letter uh, with the, uh, the purpose of being a blessing to the members of that Corinthian uh, fellowship. He believes that he's going to be able to help them. And of course he did. But in writing that letter, not only did he help the Corinthian fellowship, he also did what? He helped folks right here, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He's helping me, helping you. So Paul's love for, for that Corinthian church not only blessed them, but has also flowed where? All, all over the world. Remember I talk, we talked about that, the, 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 the flowing of God's goodness? You know, as long as you allow it to flow, you, won't, you, know, you don't allow it to, I don't want it all to just come to me. You know, I want it to go, I, I, I want it to come, if it, if it comes to me, I have to allow it to go to somebody else. That's the goodness of the Lord, right? And oftentimes people try to use that as a means for why people need to, don't let your money stay with you, but you pass it on. And yes, you can use it for that, but the real aspect of it is, is your ministry, your, your gift. God blesses you with a gift, like Paul had. He was a chief apostle, and he wrote these letters as an, as an apostle should do, and give instruction, and it blessed, it, uh, blessed the Corinthian church, but also blessed Christians throughout all eternity. We'll be reading this word forever, and so we thank God for that. Any other comments or questions before we close?